Hello people, welcome back to my channel and in today's video we will be seeing what is teacher forcing in deep learning. So teacher forcing is a technique which is used to uh, train your uh, neural network but especially it's called as a RNN that is recurrent neural networks. So before we begin into uh, what is teacher forcing, we will first understand what is sequential and non-sequential data is. So we have sequential and non-sequential data. So, so far when we learn about machine learning and deep learning steps, we usually treat data in a non-sequential manner. So we don't have an assumption like from where our data is getting generated. So it could be in a CSV file or it could be generated from a software program or in some other uh, scenarios like uh, it can be normally distributed or you transform into some other distribution like uniform distribution or some other distributions that you can name. So that is non-sequential data is. And so uh, you don't have any dependencies associated with non-sequential data in most of the cases because it is just random. Like you basically used to classify those instances. Just we have this 0, 1 prediction or we have defaulter or non-defaulter. Those kind of toy examples we basically have with this non-sequential data. But in the real world, that's not the case, especially with neural networks or when we design a RNN that is recurrent neural networks, what we basically have to deal is with the sequential data. So sequential data means it arrives in a stream. Say, for example, you have some word or sentences. Say, now from that particular window, Say you have a window in order to analyze certain sequences of instances that is arriving. Say here we have deadline and there are some words before, some words after of this window. Consider this as a small window of say some size n is equal to 10. Now uh, say like we are doing a classification or a prediction problem like what the next sequence or next word occurrence would be. So it can be like there can be two cases is or are. So usually with the NLP use cases, it becomes very difficult in order to do some NLP use cases like for prediction of the upcoming sequence of the text. So for that you need to understand what the context is. So for example, if we don't consider this particular sequence uh, like the way how we used to do with the non-sequential data, what can happen is possibly it can break this particular uh, word into two different words. Now you know deadline has a different meaning and dead and line. So if we consider this as S1 and S2, this has two separate meanings. So in your prediction, if you don't consider this as a one single particular word, then your prediction will go wrong. So for that cases, you have to do sequential modeling. So especially we can see like language dependencies. Or say for example, you are doing some language translation. Like uh, you have German to English, something like that. So for example, in English you have data set. Okay, so this is in English. And now in German, you want to convert this. So say for example, this data is called as Daten in German, that is Deutsch. And set is called as Menge. Now, say for example, you don't consider this as one particular word and you consider this as two particular, two words. Then the meaning changes and this doesn't mean like data set and something else. So especially in that case, what you need is to have the translation. So word dependencies in the long term sequences. So that is usually dealt with RNN or in some cases you have LSTMs that is long short term memories. So there you have to model these kind of dependencies where the next sequence of the word, say you have at time t and you want to predict what will be the next word at time t plus one. 
p plus 1. So in order to model this, you need to have the contextual information about what the previous word would be, that is it, t minus 1. So this essentially is a sequential modeling or a sequential classification where you need to have the context of the previous words in that particular window or in the occurrence. So usually our feed forward neural network that is FFN doesn't have a memory. That means it doesn't consider words in a sequence but as and when the words arrives it just processes it and classifies it. So that's not the case with RNN. RNN you need to have a memory in order to know what the previous word was. So in order to do that, FFN might not be a ideal case. So for that you need to have RNN. Now we'll understand what teacher forcing and where this exactly comes into this. So now let's look into uh, RNN architecture that is a recurrent neural network. So as you can see here, this is a usual a recurrent neural network which is in a compacted form which is uh, drawn in this blue part. Now here on the right hand side you have the unfolded version of this RNN. So I'll just go through each of these nodes. So X is the input what you feed into this network. H is a hidden unit. W is the weight. U is the weight used to train this particular hidden to hidden layers that is there inside this uh, architecture. Then uh, from hidden to output you have V which is a weight associated in this connection. Then from O to L, now L is a set of labels. And Y is the final output. This is the input, hidden these are weights or you can call as biases and this is the output and you can see there is a looping here so that looping is characterized for recurrent neural networks so you can see like there can be n number of uh, hidden units so that is a, again a hyperparameter which depends upon your use case or how many times you have to train your model so it is for that. So that's why their looping exists. Now, in order to simplify this, what I have done is I've unfolded this network into timestamps. So here you can see that there is no time factor that is coming into picture. But if you closely look into the architecture deeply inside or when you code this particular stuff in Python, you can see that it has been unfolded or you have to unfold it in time steps. So, so this H that is the hidden unit at time t minus 1 looks something like this. So it receives a set of input at that particular time step. Then it has an output at that particular time step. Then whatever you compute here that is sent with the help of a weight that is W to a hidden unit at time step t which receives an input x at time t with a weight u and output at t which is again used to predict. So this can be considered as a phase for prediction. So our language translation use case. Let's take that example here. So what would be the next word in the sequence? So that is solved with the help of a hidden layer at time t plus 1 which receives an input at t plus 1 with a weight u at time t plus 1. So you might have observed or you can see there are weights that is getting uh, repeated every time here and there or here also you can see that there are different weights here. Now, now why this is the case? or why there are a different number of uh, or this weights in this architecture or why there are so many. Like in the usual neural networks what we had is W transpose X plus V. So where X was our input and we had the weights W and V. Now here what you can see there are U, V, W and there are many other weights in this network. So why this kind of parameters are there or why these many parameters are there if you can train just only with two different or one different kind of weights. 
Now, this is the peculiar property of this. So, remember, in recurrent neural networks, there is a concept called as parameter sharing. That means parameters are shared across the entire network architecture. It is simple. Now, say for example, if you don't do parameter sharing or you just have only one weight, say we have a universal weight W which is shared across this. So what happens is like in neural networks, you have a problem of symmetry breaking. So that problem can happen in this architecture. And what will happen is like if a weight is learned for this particular step, it might get propagated for the uh, next consecutive layers and if by chance there is some error during the training or some due to incomplete epochs or something like that, it can get optimized in the entire network and the prediction power may go down and thereby your language translation might fail. So that is a simple scenario where this parameter sharing can be helpful. So that is the reason why you have this U, V, W weights. So whenever you have a RNN, you have U, V, W triplets defined as weights, but with simple neural networks, you have this W and B, that is weights and biases for the training. Now, where teacher forcing comes into picture, so that is interesting. Say you are doing, now again language prediction, what the next particular word in the sequence is. So, if you know, uh, like I am giving an example. So, I am saying where, where. Now, there can be two possibilities, is or are. So, parameter sharing is nothing but you share these weights across your entire architecture for different units. So those equations are written here. We'll come to this part later. Now let's focus on this. Now you have this xt minus 1 to ht minus 1. There is a weight u. Here you have u, u. So that is identical. That means this particular weight is shared across this part. That is from input to the hidden. Now from hidden to the output, you have V. And then across this hidden to hidden, this part, you have W. So these weights are shared, that is U, V and W. So these triplets for a RNN are shared across this entire architecture. Now you might ask, in neural networks, we don't have these many weights. But for RNN, why do we require so many weights? Like you have this W X plus B. So you had this W and B that is weights and biases. So if you remember that in neural networks, there is a problem called as problem of symmetry or symmetry breaking. That means if all the weights are initialized uniformly, then your neural network cannot learn appropriately at different units. So that is the reason why you have different weights at different units so that the same weight is not optimized across the entire unit. So for each units or for each subparts, we want to learn different weights accordingly so that our prediction can be as best as possible. So that is a simple reason. Now let's move on to this uh, equation part. So at each time step, we have some activation functions. So that is defined by this equation that is AT U X T. So it takes the weight with this input part plus this uh, function. So W H T minus one is a function of some weight function plus some bias that you have. So it is comprised of three different parts U X T W H T minus one and plus B. So that is for this part. So I have just written for this part, so you can just propagate it for other layers, you can calculate accordingly. Then whatever you get here, so that is the hidden, so that is HT. So whatever you process here that you can obtain at this part. So here what we have kept is a tan H function. So which will put into plus one minus one into that range. And this activation function is given here. Activation function can be anything ReLU, Softmax, softmax we don't only really put in this between layers, but we usually put at the final layer for prediction or for multi-class classification, something like that. 
and then the output that is OT is characterized that is this part is characterized by VHT whatever you get from this uh, HT that is the hidden output with a weight plus some C bias and finally what we have is W cap T that is softmax of OT so this W and uh, sorry this Y and Y cap is used for your prediction that if your ground truth matches with the uh, given output or predicted output by the neural network or not. Now here is the catch. Now if there is some mistake in this part or your prediction is not the way that you desired, what you usually do is you have some ground truth at this part that is OT minus 1. You just directly feed to the hidden layer of the next time step. So output of the previous time step is directly feeded to the uh, hidden unit at the next time step. So similarly here this uh, ground truth is fitted to the hidden and not you don't consider this but you can skip this in some of the cases according to how you train your network. So this is called as teacher forcing. You force the network to learn what is there exactly in the ground truth. So in this scenario like in the data set you know it is where R but your model somehow predicts its where is that itself is wrong. So in that case your prediction power might go down. So in that cases you do this teacher forcing. So it's a fancy term but its concept is simple. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you found this video helpful please do like share comment and if you are new to this channel please hit the subscribe button. Thank you very much for watching this video.